So, what's love got to do with it? You know, Tina Turner, not the one that comes to church here, but the Grammy Award-winning Tina Turner, she's been asking this song since 1984. The song came out the same year I was born. Elton John wondered if you can feel the love tonight. Dolly Parton, before Whitney, saying, I'll always love you. The Beatles saying, all you need is love. And John Paul Young said, love is in the air. Songs about love are really not about love at all. They are about affection, longing, goosebumpy type of emotional thrills that happens when we think about someone who means a lot to us. This love runs hot. This love runs cold. It runs lukewarm. It brings tears of joy. It brings tears of depression and screams of excitement and hollers of disappointment. Anybody say amen? amen? We've all been on the roller coaster of that kind of love, right? But that's really not the love that I'm going to talk to you about this morning. What I'm talking about this morning is totally different. It is the love through hell or high water kind of love. It is the love that nailed a savior to a cross kind of love. It is the kind of love that caused him to break out the bonds of, the, of death and to, to rise again in, in power and in life. It is the kind of love that keeps him on the throne next to his father interceding for us. That's the kind of love I want to talk about today. Stand with me, if you will. We're going to be reading from 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 16. And while you get there, I'm going to take a little drink. It says in 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the perpetuation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this service today. We thank you for the people who fill this room. We thank you, Lord, for your spirit that has come and dwells in this place. Lord, we ask you as a minister today that you would open ears and open hearts. That distractions, Father God, would fall to the wayside and that we would put um, our attention solely on you today. And Lord, that you would move in this place, up and down each aisle and in each row, Father God. That we would hear from you this morning and we would have a better understanding of love. The kind of love, Father God, that, that moved you uh, to to sacrifice your son and for Jesus to give up the wealth of heaven, to come and to live on earth and to, to be led to the cross. Lord, we all love things, in quotes. But Lord, we want to move beyond that kind of love that these songs that I spoke about this morning talk about. And we want to move into the kind of sacrificial love that you have for us and still do. 
Move again in this place today. Allow us to see your glory reign as we give this whole service over to you. We pray and we give thanks in that matchless, mighty name of Jesus. And God's people say, Amen. You may be seated. So I talked a little bit about these songs, and I talked a little bit about the artist who sang them. I guess I didn't talk about them. I told you who sang them. And then we read this scripture, and we begin to understand what love is and what love really should be. You know, when you're a teenager and you fall in love, you get these goosebumps and you can't stand to be separated from the person. And then like the very next hour, you hate the person. You can't stand the sight of them. And sometimes it's like that as we get older and even in marriage from one hour to the next. But that's not what love is. And sometimes we need God to help remind us and to help us in our, our natural minds to understand the kind of love that drove him to the cross, the kind of love that motivated him to give up all of glory and to come and to dwell here on earth. And so hopefully we can have a better understanding of that this morning. But what does human love look like? Human love is conditional. We love people oftentimes because of their performance, because of their knowledge, because of their beauty. Think about those three things. Their performance, their knowledge, and their beauty. Sometimes we love people as long as they can do something for us and we get benefit out of the relationship. Sometimes I love you because I get something out of you. And the moment you stop giving me what I wanted, I, I'm done with you. I don't have any more time for you. I don't have anything else I can give you. I'm finished. It's conditional. People will love until they've gotten everything that they can get out of a person. And then they're finished. But the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 7 that love bears all things. It says in that scripture, love bears all things regardless of of what comes. It believes all things, looking for the best in each one. It hopes all things, remaining steadfast during difficult times. It endures all things without weakening. And think about the way we love people. Is this how we love people? Is it how we love the drunk on the street? Is this how we love people who don't live the lifestyle that is appropriate according to our own convictions? Is this how we love people who don't look like us and who don't act like us? Is this how we love people? Are we bearing, are we putting up, are we able to, to, to even stand to be in a room with people whose life doesn't align with the Bible? Jesus hung out with these people. Jesus loved these people. Jesus went to the cross for these people. He didn't just go to the cross for New Life Christian Ministries or for the Protestant church. He didn't just go for the church of God. He didn't just go for those who wear white robes or who sing in the choir or stand behind the pulpit. Jesus loved people. It drove him all the way to the cross. It caused the crown of thorns to be placed on his head, the whips on, uh, on his back, the blood to be shed from his side. It caused him to lay down his entire life. So does love bear all things? Does love endure all things? Or have we changed love to meet our needs right now? When things are good, I love you. When you're doing what I want you to do, I love you. When my bills are paid, I love you. As long as it's for me and about me, I love you. But when things become bad and the honeymoon is over, or when I stop doing with, uh, things with you and with my focus, and you're replaced by something else, when I run out of money and I run out of time, and I can no longer cope with things day to day, do you still love me? Do I still love you? What happens now is that someone, oftentimes in marriages, is replaced. 
In friendships, we cut people off. Families fall apart. Friendships die and relationships and marriages break away. And now it's so easy. It's like getting a new outfit. Out with the old, in with the new. It's like turning the page in a book. It's so easy for some reason. We've gotten in the habit of not wanting to put up with certain obstacles. It's gotten too difficult to love you. It's gotten too hard for me to put up with you. It's hard for us to want to put in the work that's necessary to love people. And I'm not just talking about relationship, marriage, and boyfriend and girlfriend, husband and wife kind of deal. I'm talking about relationships with people, friends, and coworkers, and every other kind of relationship. It's sometimes just easier to write people off. So we got into the habit of not wanting to put up with certain obstacles or even put up with certain people. We give up. But God, our model for everyday life, won't give up on us. I've talked about human love and how that it is conditional based on performance, knowledge, and beauty. But God's love is different. He is our model for everyday life. His love is unconditional. No matter how we act, no matter how we talk, no matter how we walk or think, He is there and He cares for us and He loves us. There is a standard by which He wants us to live, but He still loves us. John 3, John, sorry, John 30, 16. No, John 3, 16. <laughs> In my notes, there's a zero there, sorry. John 3, 16. We know this because we've learned it in, in um, Sunday school. Sometimes we, we, we quote it by memory with our eyes shut, with our hands tied on our back, whatever. We think we're doing some sort of Christian calisthenics because we can quote this by memory. Like we're doing somebody a favor. But we got to understand it here and how it impacts our life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I think that this scripture in particular and many others demonstrates that love is not a feeling at all. Love is not an emotion. But love is something that we do. It is an action. It is not something we feel. You see, Jesus could have loved us from heaven. But he didn't just love us from heaven. He, he was motivated by his love to give it all up and to come here and to walk a life that he felt the pain you feel. He experienced the emotions that you feel. He experienced more excruciating pain than we can even imagine. And you think there's not days in those 33 years that he didn't long for the comfort of heaven? We know that that in the garden he cried out to God, why have you forsaken me? He said, or he said um, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. We know that he, God, in the flesh, still experienced every emotion that we would experience here. Do you think that Jesus wasn't betrayed? The whole reason he was on the cross was because he was betrayed. Other than the fact that he went there to save us. Do you think people didn't lie about Jesus? That they didn't spit on him and try to stone him and want to drag his name through the mud? They did it every day of his life. And even more so after he entered into the ministry. If they did that to Jesus, if they did it to Jesus, don't expect that our life is going to be a bed of roses, that we're going to get to walk around with our chest puffed up, and that things are going to be good every moment of every day. And yet, he didn't use these, as a re these things as a reason to stop loving us, or to turn his back on us, to say, I've done enough, I'm not doing any more, I'll let them to their own. His love drove him to do the most, 
to die the most excruciating death a human person could possibly die. I like to read John 3.16 this way. For in this way, God so loved the world. Because it changes it just a little bit for me that he just, he loved us. And then he said, but it tells me that in this way he demonstrated his love. He acted on his love. You see, we say all the time we love things. We love mashed potatoes. We love classic cars and movies and music. We love the beach. We love, I'm so glad that Jesus didn't just love me in that way. He was driven to love me in a way that is so much deeper and that now my life isn't hanging in the balance. My soul doesn't stand between heaven and hell. My soul can be claimed as a child of God, and I've got a hope for eternal glory to spend it with Jesus one day. And for Romans 5, 8, another, another scripture that tells us that but God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We expect that, that sometimes we think that we have to come and we have to get life right, that we have to look right, act right, that we have to act the part, that we have to know the right things and sing the right songs in order for Jesus to love us. But he loved us in spite of us. He loved us even while we were still sinners. He loved you before you were formed in your mother's womb. He loved you before you ever uttered a word. He loved you and still died for you. And he showed us his love by doing just that. It would be one thing for him to, to sit on a throne in heaven with his arms crossed and his legs one over the other looking, oh, I love them. They're great. They're going to hell and I, I, I could do something about it, but I'm not going to. I'm so glad that Jesus didn't love us from a distance. Aren't you, church? It was the love from the Father that had sent him to this sin-filled world. It was love from Jesus that sent him to the cross. And it, we think about the nails. My son Seth has recently learned about the nine-inch nails, and he is amazed by the fact that those nails could be so long. And we've talked about how they would have been placed in Jesus, and he's amazed by it. But it wasn't even those nails that held my Jesus to the cross. It was, or he could have gotten down. We've heard it said he could have called 10,000 angels. But he decided that he would stay put, that he would hang it out, that he would give it up. It was love that held him to the cross. Genesis 127, I used this a couple of weeks ago when I talked about the sanctity of life, but it is important to know this again, that for God, so God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he, him, male, and female created he them. He created us, and it says that he created us in his own image. Well, we read a few moments ago in John that God is love. So when we as Christians are made in the image of God, we should reflect something. When you are looking in a mirror, then you see a reflection. And when people look at us, they should see a reflection if they're looking for the image of God. And in us, they should see love because God is love. If you were this morning reflecting the image of God in which you were created, then you would be reflecting love. Reflecting love to people who are Christians and reflecting love to people who are not. Reflecting people or love to people who are healthy and reflecting love to people who need healing. Reflecting love to people who are rich and reflecting love to people who are poor. Reflecting love. Love. So what does love got to do with it? 
God is love. John 13, 34, 35 says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have loved one to another. Love one for another doesn't, make a, doesn't change the world. Love to one another does. What's the difference, Pastor Todd? Because Jesus could have just had love for the world and not been motivated to do anything about us in our sin sick state. But he had love to the world and that while we were yet sinners, he came and he died. And if we can have a love for this world and not even care that they're going to hell in a handbasket. But when we have love to the world, we will go out into the world and we will do our very best to make sure that we can snatch every one of them out of hell. It is not enough to say that we are loving and praying for a world that is lost. We have to show our love to this world. You know, they have to see Jesus. They have to see Jesus. And where are they going to see Jesus if they don't know where to look? Where are they going to see Jesus if they're not willing to come to church? Where are they going to see Jesus if they don't know uh, what to help with and where to read in the Bible? They should see Jesus in Pastor Todd and in Pastor Ken and in Deacon Steve and in Brother Chris and in Miss Charlotte and in Brother Randy and in Colby and in everybody else across the sanctuary. <laughs> Love is not optional. Did you hear when I read that? A new commandment I give unto you. He is telling us this is something you have to to do. I'm not saying that you can or that you should. This is a good option. You have to love. Some people are hard to love. Some personalities are harder than others to love. But you know for some people you are that person, you are that personality. I don't think you like that. But even though you are that person and you are that personality, Jesus died for you and he loved you enough in spite of yourself and he sees you for what he created you to be. We have to learn to look at people not through our eyes and our own expectations, but to look at them through the eyes and the love of Christ, seeing the purpose that they were creating. Lord, help us to love the way you loved us. With love and action, the homeless are housed, the hungry are fed, the discarded are embraced. With love, the backbiting stops. I didn't hear any men. With love, the backbiting stops. With love, the overlooked are seen. With love, the darkness turns to light. With love, we esteem others higher than we esteem ourselves. With love, we forgive others. With love, the darkness come, becomes light and we forgive others. Instead of loving like Jesus called us to do, oh, the Christians, we, you know, so high and mighty hold grudges. We hold each other back. We fight against each other, tearing each other down, which is in a direct opposition to the word of God, which says that we should edify one another and build each other up. Christians look down on the poor in spirit. We gossip about anyone and everything about everything. It's no wonder the black eyed peas were wondering where is the love. <laughs> to know God is to know love because God is love. You know, church, it doesn't matter how good we are at having worship and vacation Bible school and egg hunts. It doesn't matter how good we are at sending people to the Dominican Republic. It doesn't matter how good we are at shaking hands when people come into the church. If we don't have love for one another, we have to get it down into inside of ourselves and realize that Jesus loved us enough to die for us. We might have to die for each other sometimes. And we better love each other in a different way.
1 John 4, 20 to 21. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must also love his brother. So if you have hate in your heart this morning for somebody in your life, for something that they've done, for something they haven't done, for something you think they've done, and sometimes that's all it is. We make things up in our mind about people, and then we got a problem with them, and then we're not right with God. We have to understand if we have a spot of hate, we got to cry out to say, God, I want to love people the way you love people. You have to help me, Lord, uncover these dark corners of my life or my heart. Shed you the light of Christ so that I can love people the way you love them. I want to love people the way you love me, Jesus. If you forgive me, Lord God, and help me to forgive other people. I want to love people with a pure heart and with clean hands. I want to see people the way Jesus sees people. So if you have that kind of feeling in your heart this morning and you say you love God, the Bible says that you're a liar. Not one of us wants to stand before God a liar. And so when, we, when the word exposes to us something about us that is not right and doesn't align with the word of God, we are now obligated to make it right before God. We cannot sit in the knowledge of light and darkness. We have to take it before the throne of God and do something with it. Present it to the throne today, church. God is saying in these scriptures, how can you not love or how can you um, not love someone that you might even be sitting beside today in church, someone that you might have rode the church with, somebody that you interact with at work. How can you love God and have a problem with those people? When you truly love God and follow him, he gives us a new heart. He gives us a new mind. And we can't but help to love others in spite of the things they've said and the things they've done and all of that. God helps us to love them in a new way. Think about this. Love is a language that speaks to the heart of those that it encounters. Love can be heard by a deaf man. Think about that. Love is a language that can be heard by a deaf person. Love can be seen by a blind man. And it can be felt by a man who has no feeling. So what does love got to do with it? How can I love someone that's mistreated me and someone that hurt me? That's a good question. I'm glad that you're asking me. Matthew 5, 44 says, But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Let's read it again, just for fun. But I say to you, love your enemies. That doesn't sound fun. But what is the outcome if we don't? Then we stand before God as liars, as I just read to you. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. There are going to be people who curse you, who say bad things about you, who want to see bad come to you. But we are to bless them. Do good to those who hate you. There are going to be people who hate you. There are going to be people who hate you for the sole reason that you've named Christ as your Savior. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. We need to stop talking about people and start praying for people. Jesus prayed for his friends. Jesus prayed for his enemies. Even on the cross, his love had him pray, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them. Here they are, they're killing him. They've done beating him. They ripped his beard out. They put the crown of thorns on his head. They, they pierced his side. They've done the unthinkable to this man. 
Yet he finds it inside of himself to say, Father, forgive them. So they might have put a nasty post about you on Facebook. You can forgive them. They might have said something about you or your kids, but you can forgive them because they haven't plucked your hair out and put you on a cross. And even if they did, forgive them because God said so. If Jesus can forgive while dying on the cross, then we can forgive too. Sometimes we don't forgive because we don't want to. I just can't forgive. You can forgive. You just don't want to. It's so much, it's so much more fun to sit back and have feelings towards somebody and to get other people involved in it and to talk about them and say, you know, so and so, eh, that might be fun in a moment, but in a season, another season, you will reap what you sow and God will not be pleased by it. He wants you to love them, pray for them, and lift them up before the throne of God. I'm going to ask that the worship team come. So I'm going to ask you again, what does love got to do with it? We can answer Tina Turner's question. For us, love has got everything to do with it. You see, if we would summarize the entire book of the Bible, all 66 books, it would be summarized in that word love. He loved us. Greater love had, in John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for a friend. Which takes us back to John 3, 16, because he acted on his love. He acted on his love. So let's this morning understand what the love of God really is. And let's understand that sometimes, more often than not, it's not enough to say love, but we've got to do it. We've got to be, we've got to act on it. Driven out into the world to be the laborers for this harvest that is great. In 1 Peter 4, 8, think about this for yourself. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. What did love do for you? Jesus' love for you covered a multitude of your sins. His love for me covered a multitude of sins. His love for our church did the same thing. And so our love for the world has to cover a multitude of sins, not to overlook the sin and make excuses and make people feel comfortable in their sin, but to love them in spite of their sin, to call them out of sin, and to preach Jesus crucified and resurrected and give them the hope that we have of eternal glory in heaven. We can coddle people to hell, but we want to rock them to heaven. We want, to, we want them to understand that, that Jesus is the rock, that he's the way, the truth, and whatever lie they've been told and whatever, whatever life they live and whatever they, they believe, it, Jesus will cover it. He loved them enough to die, but we have to love them in the in meanwhile. Until they can understand his love, we have to show them the love. So it is that love has everything to do with it. Stand with me, if you will. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for this message, Father God. We thank you for your heart towards us that you knew what you were getting yourself into because you knew us before we were born before we even started messing up, yet you were still willing to die. Your love drove you to the cross, and thank you for your love that held you there. Lord, help us to see people through your eyes. And Lord, help us to love people the way you love people. Lord, understanding that when we're impatient and when we're critical and when we want to hold everybody accountable for every mistake that they make, Lord God, that we are not loving them with your love and that we are doing more harm to the kingdom than we are good. Help us, Father God, to love people and to point them to the cross so that they would not just see it, but they would have an encounter with it and that they would know the Jesus who died there and the Jesus who now lives and still loves them. 
Lord, if there's somebody in this place who doesn't know you and hasn't experienced that love that, that drove you to the cross, I pray that by your spirit you would arrest them today. That they would feel you, that they would know you're calling them, Father God, and that they would give themselves their heart, their sinful nature, their life, their hopes and dreams for tomorrow, that they would give it all to you, Lord. And that they would walk out of here a brand new creature, as your word says, the old being done and the new being alive. And Lord, let us celebrate with them as they have been resurrected on this beautiful day. Father, we ask that if there's anybody here who has something in their heart, Lord, that, that doesn't please you, they have hate or hurt or something that they're holding against someone else, Lord God, and it's causing a chasm between you and them, that God, that your spirit would illuminate that, that they would bring it to light, Father God, that they would surrender it today, once and by one last time to you at the cross, that they could walk out of here, Lord, renewed, refreshed, Father God, and ready to serve you for the rest of their life. Lord, thank you for moving. Thank you, Lord, for speaking through me. Thank you, Lord, for coming to church with us today. For we love your power, we love your presence. We give thanks to you. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Amen. If God loves us so much, he never asks us to do anything that he won't help us in. And I was thinking as Pastor Todd was preaching, there's so many times as Christians that we have opportunity. God puts us in situations to reach out and to love people that sometimes have criticized us, sometimes have treated us wrongly, sometimes we don't, you know, we don't want to take the opportunity that God gives us. But I found over and over again that when our hearts are willing, which is what love is, it's not about emotion, it's not about feeling, it's about doing the right thing no matter what. But when you do, the book of Romans says that God, through the Holy Spirit, will shed the love of the Holy Ghost through our hearts and through our lives. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And if you keep his commandments, his love, he will love a spouse through you. He will love a neighbor through you. He will love your enemies through you if you'll love him. Thank you so much for worshiping with us and please come back next week and bring someone with you, amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of renewing, refreshing, Father God, to sit in your presence, to sit in, just to hear your word, Father God. Thank you for the hope that was preached today. Father God, my prayer is that each and every person here today, Lord, that this love that Pastor Todd spoke of, that your word speaks of, that we see as Jesus himself, this love, Father God, that each one of us might take it with us. And Father God, those people that we encounter this week, Lord, that we might love on them, those people who are unkind to us, annoying to us. They may even be a thorn unto our side. Father God, help us to be Jesus to them. Help us to demonstrate this love, this unconditional love that you had for us when we were unlovely. When we were a thorn in your side, you loved us. and You continually called us. Father, help us to take this love out into our workplace, our home, wherever we go this week, Father God. Help us to love people, truly love people. Lord, I ask that you be with each person. Holy Spirit, just guide our footsteps, guide our eyes, our hearts. Lord, be a light unto our path this coming week, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.